Well, good morning, everyone. You can hear me at the back. Um, my firing squad moment. Um, uh, well, that, Sam, thank you for that amazing intro. I think the only direction after that is probably downwards. Um, so I'll, tr I'll try not to live too far down to Sam's intro. Um, so yeah, thank you for being here. I'm always amazed anyone. Hello, Mark. You're late. Uh, <coughs> uh, there are seats at the front if you're standing at the back. If you wanna, if you wanna see. Um, yeah, no, I'm honoured, thrilled, and just delighted, and rather amazed and baffled to find myself here. Um, I didn't sleep till about 3.30 in the morning last night. I had this kind of spinning through my head, all sorts of rehearsed intros. Um, what I'm going to do, I think, this morning is, is take you on a journey, and the journey's going to start in the 14th, 15th century, and we are going to kick off there with someone called the Habitual Drunkard, and we are going to move forward through time and space to 1930, and, and the birth of AA in 35. And what I'm going to try and do, I think, is share with you um, various ways of thinking about drunkenness um, and, 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 and have a look at how discourses of drunkenness have changed over the centuries. And by doing that, I think, we can start to understand AA discourse and we can understand the older pre-existing discourses that it drew on and which it synthesised. So that's the mission. Um, Okay, medieval Europe. I mean, um, the way to think about it is in medieval Europe, or late medieval Europe, um, everyone drank basically all day long. Um, people in northern Europe drank beer, and in southern Europe they drank wine. Um, those of you who know your Shakespeare will remember there are references to small beer, if that rings bells. Uh, small beer was slightly weaker beer. That would be typically a breakfast beer. Um, I oh, actually did once have a client, an alcoholic, and he, he talked about drinking small beer for breakfast, by which he meant little small tins of Heineken, which I quite enjoyed. He'd done an English degree. Um, uh, he'd say, yeah, I just had... I said, you relapsed? He'd say, no, I just had some small beer. Um, so uh, alcohol use was a, was a completely integrated part of, of, of medieval man's life. And, I, and I'm using the word man advisedly because in those days the drunkard was very much gendered. It was very much constructed as a man. As we'll see, there was a shift in gender focus in the 18th century towards women. Um, but at this point, it was the man. So alcohol use was a completely integrated part of life, and it was actually a very sensible option. You know, drinking water probably wasn't very safe, and actually beer, wine, was a much safer bet. You're much, likely to get, uh, much less likely to get ill. Um, and, you know, this was an ancient pattern of drinking. And if, if the sort of daily pattern was top-up alcohol use, it was also accompanied by uproarious binges. Uh, feast days, festivals, saints' days. Now, f from a sort of modern diagnostic angle, we'd probably think of medieval man or medieval society, because it was children, men and women, as being society of alcoholics. Um, but of course, there was no discourse of alcoholism at that time. The alcoholic had not yet been invented. Um, but there was a discourse of habitual drunkenness. And we're going to have a look at that now. So, I suppose an obvious point is, in a society where everyone drank, how do you sift out the deviant drinker from the normal drinker? Um, and the answer really was that the deviant drinker, the deviant drunkard, the habitual drunkard, he could be known through his sinning, his sinful behaviour while drunk. That's what, was, that's what marked him out as um, a habitual drunkard, as opposed to just a normal heavy drinker. The sins in question um, were gluttony, blasphemy, fornication, lust, profligacy, and murder. Um, interestingly, at this point, drunkenness was, was, was seen as a subset of gluttony. So the Latin word for gluttony is gula, which you can see at the bottom of the... I think that's, a, that's from Hieronymus Bosch, um, the Garden of Earthly Delights. So the, the, the habitual drunkard is understood to be a glutton for, for alcohol. Okay, these are the kind of sins that um, he was likely to engage in. So, in other words, the problem wasn't so much the sin of drunkenness, because everyone was drunk pretty much most of the time. It was the sinful behaviour that some people engaged in when they were drunk. Um, so this is a moral discourse. It's one in which the, the, the habitual drunkard is constructed as a sinner. And the problem is, of course, to his soul. It's to his own personal salvation. <coughs> 
Um, and I've thrown in a couple of citations. Innocent May, that, I mean, he, he was much later. I mean, he was late 17th century. Um, but he preached a famous sermon in our American colonies in Massachusetts. Any Americans in the room? There's a few. Um, and woe to drunkards. He was preaching to the habitual drunkard. 30 years later, his son, Cotton, preached another famous sermon where Cotton Mather spoke about alcohol as the good servant of God. So how do you, make, how do you reconcile that? On the one hand, it's a good servant of God. On the other hand, woe to drunkards. And the answer is, innocent is preaching to the habitual drunkard, to the drunken sinner. So the habitual drunkard was the legitimate subject and object of religious authority. He fell within in moral discourse. So what did that mean? Um, in terms of religious sanction, it was local, it was in the community, it was possibly um, a bollocking from the pulpit, it was um, maybe a scolding from the drunkard's wife, it was possibly being put in something called the drunkard's stocks, um, could even involve being given something called the drunkard's cloak, we'll, we'll see an image of that in a second. Drunkards, anyone heard of the drunkard's cloak? That was a wooden barrel with a hole in it for the head, which would be put over the drunkard so that their arms were trapped and they couldn't drink. And they <laughs> could be a new, a new, a new technology of recovery. Uh, <laughs> the streets of London covered with people in drunkards' coats. Um, so the religious sanction. The point there was it was local. It was communal. Um, state sanction was minimal. The, the, the first um, English legislation that I'm aware of is the Alehouses Act of 1551. Um, and all that really did was it forced um, places that sold alcohol to be licensed, to pay quite a small licensing fee. But what it was really targeted at was it was targeted at separating the drinking of the wealthy, of the property classes, from the drinking of the poor. So the Alehouses Act forced the poor to drink in inns and the wealthy property people to drink in taverns. And the reason for that is it says something about preoccupation with harm, as it was understood then by the state. It was seen as a major harm if um, the wealthy got drunk in the same place as the poor because there was the fear of um, upset of the natural order, that drunken foolishness on the part of the, the wealthy would perhaps set bad example, give, give kind of dangerous ideas to the poor. An important point, and, and this is something we'll come back to in a couple hundred years' time when we get to Hogarth, is there was no sense that the habitual drunkard posed any form of harm to the nation's health. It was a very much a personal matter for their soul, and it was a local matter for their community. Now, in order to understand behaviour, while you know, if, if you're behaving certain ways while drunk, which are sort of bad ways of behaviour. For that to be understood as sinful, there has ontologically to be a unity of willpower and desire. In other words, the habitual drunkard was understood as choosing to drink, willing to drink, desiring to drink, and loving to drink. Um, so epistemologically, you could know the habitual drunkard through his sins. If, you, if the question was, who, who in this community where everyone drinks is a habitual drunkard, the answer was, look for the sinner, look for the sins. That, you know, DSM now, you know, again, we have this discourse of normal drinking and deviant drinking. I might say to Mark Fennick, you know, <laughs> uh, what do you reckon? And Mark might say, well, I've gone through DSM 5 and they scored 7 out of 11 and they have a severe substance use disorder. Um, so this is an important point too, this, this discourse of drinking more than is seemly. This, is, this discourse starts to develop, according to social historians, in around 1400. This idea that you have normal drinking and deviant drinking. At this point, deviant drinking lives in sinful behaviour. It's a religious discourse. And the alcoholic, or the drunkard, is the subject of religious sanction. All with me so far? Good. Now, fascinatingly, in the sort of mid to late 17th century in Stuart, England, uh, a minority discourse was starting to develop of drunkenness as simultaneously disease, sin, and compulsion. And it's fascinating for a lot of reasons. 
I think, importantly, because historians, academics, normally place around 1800 and Benjamin Rush as when a disease concept of addiction first appeared. However, most of the books are written by Americans and have an American, Americocentric uh, view of the world. And um, Jessica Warner, who's the foremost social historian of this period, she discovered in the 90s a whole trove of forgotten sermon manuscripts um, from, from Stuart England, which conclusively show actually that a disease discourse but it was starting to emerge then, 100 years before Rush or 130 years before Rush. Um, I'll take you through a little, some, some, some quotes from those manuscripts. Um, so, remember, the, the, the dominant discourse at this point is the medieval discourse of um, the habitual drunkard has been a sinner. However, this minority discourse that was clearly around um, slightly contradicts that. You've got Bishop Berry, who's, uh, who talks of men addicted to drunkenness. This disease has become epidemical, and all the physicians in England know not how to set a stop to it. That's quite a modern thing to say, isn't it? I mean, many doctors might still, you know. <laughs> uh, Scrivener uh, spoke of drunkenness as this epidemical disease. And then Stockton spoke of drunkenness as an enticing, bewitching sin, very hardly left by those that are addicted to it. Um, so this is quite radical, actually. I mean, to us, maybe it's quite normal to think of addiction as, as a disease. But this, this is really radical. This is an emerging minority discourse. Um, However, the problem, of course, is that it's, it's an incoherent one because it's, um, it's, it's mixing disease and sin and compulsion together. Um, and that doesn't work logically. But nonetheless, um, there's a sense of a new way of thinking about drunkenness starting to emerge. I've thrown in a couple of quotes from Stuart Drunkards. Um, it has got such power over me as that I can't withstand it. I'm so enslaved to it that I think it is in vain to pray for help against it, for I fear there is no hope that I should ever be able to be made to leave off this sin. I mean, this is quite a recognizably modern construction of the experience of alcoholism, I think, because this is speaking about compulsion. Um, okay. So what we're starting to see is that um, we're moving from the old religious discourse which constructed the drunkard as desiring to drink, willing to drink and loving to drink. And we're moving towards a sort of new emerging discourse of, of, of a compulsion to drink. Um, and I think that that's recognisable to us, that the drunkard now, this, in this new minority discourse, is unable to apply willpower to not drink. So in summary, as we turn into the Enlightenment, um, before there was an alcoholic, there was the drunkard. So the, and the drunkard possessed certain features and signs that marked him out as deviant. Um, and the key point here, maybe, is that the, dr the habitual drunkard was not constructed as having anything in them that made them drink to excess beyond a sinful nature. So the problem, therefore, was internal, and it lay in them in their sinful nature. We've touched on this, this, this idea that minority discourse of drunkenness as compulsion, disease and sin was starting to come, to come about in the, in the sort of 1670s. And there's obviously an ideological dilemma in this idea that drunkenness can be simultaneously disease and sin um, because a disease is beyond willpower, uh, but willpower is required in order to sin. So it, do, it doesn't get here, it doesn't make sense. Um, you can't be both a sinner and diseased. Um, but one way of, of, of resolving that problem, uh, as we're going to see, is to separate willpower from desire, which, of course, moral philosophy of the 18th century allowed us to do. So, yeah, well, we're now moving to the 18th century, so we're leaving behind the medieval habitual drunkard. Um, I mean, the 18th century, 1700s, an incredibly exciting time to be alive. Um, it was the age of uh, the Enlightenment. It was the age of rationalism. 
Um, it was the age of the Industrial Revolution. It was really the birth of modernity. Um, some great fashions. Um, and um, I mean, in England, <laughs> the Industrial Revolution started here, and there was um, an unbelievable movement of people from the towns, sorry, from the, from the countryside to the towns. Um, initially young men, soon followed by young women. Um, and probably what was important was that A, people were separated from their communities. Um, people came into the towns, into slums. Um, you, had, you had workhouses, you had workshops, you had factories. Um, huge amount of poverty. Um, and of course you had cheap gin, um, which we'll, we'll get onto in a sec. Um, you also, of course, had the rise of um, the bourgeois ethic of self-control as the supreme virtue. Work becomes the supreme, the supreme good. And, and, and that was accompanied by what's known by social historians as the Great Confinement. Um, the Great Confinement was an enlightenment movement to um, categorise... Uh, so if I, yeah, the microphone's still on, that's good. Um, <laughs> essentially, with modernism, what starts to happen is, in the old uh, medieval world, um, the state didn't pay too much attention to the individual. But as we move into modernism, individuals are scrutinised, they are evaluated, they're put into typologies, they are categorised, they are marked out on the basis of their differences. And as we move into modernity into the 18th century and the rise of work as the supreme ethic, um, the idle poor um, and those who deviate start to be removed from their communities for the very first time in England. That had never really happened before, other than leprosy. <coughs> Lepers got removed in, in medieval times. But at this point, um, it was the insane, the poor, petty criminals, vagabonds, the lame and the old. These people all started to develop social identities as um, sort of deviant other. Um, Roy Porter, I've put in a, Roy Porter is probably the great um, medical historian, um, and this is a good quote. Um, Such problem people, though different from normal citizens, were identical among themselves. Their common denominator was idleness. Um, that would have been me in addiction. Um, <laughs> the mad did not work. Those who did not work were the essence of unreason. And I think, you know, hold that thought, because as we move into the 19th century, we're going to see this discourse of confinement, this idea that you can legitimately remove people, uh, categorise them as deviant, and stick them somewhere else to train them in virtue, to train them in, 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 in the ability, let's say, to work. That, that becomes very relevant. OK, the gin craze. Um, so... It's 1688, we have a Catholic king, James II, on the throne of England. Um, and people were not too pleased about that. And his daughter, Mary, with the help of her Dutch husband. Any Dutchman in the room? Yes, well done, very good. Uh, you are responsible for this, or your <laughs> ancestors. Um, they, um, this thing called the Glorious Revolution, and William of Orange became king of England and ruled along with Mary. Now, William... Uh, was Dutch, and the Dutch liked gin, and William brought gin with him. Now, gin had been drunk in England before, before William came along, but it was a very sort of minority type of alcohol. And there was a number of factors that came together. You had a Dutch king who liked his gin. Um, there was invention of new, very efficient distilling techniques for spirits, such as gin. And England had a, had a surplus of barley because we were at war with France, Catholic France. Um, any Frenchmen in the room? Because <laughs> um, we're at war with France, um, a lot of European markets were closed to our barley. We couldn't sell our barley. And barley, of course, is the main ingredient of gin. So it made a lot of sense to start distilling this barley into gin. Also, of course, because French wine wasn't being imported by us. You know, our ports were closed to the French. Um, French wine and French brandy. Um, so gin started to be, to, be, to, be, to be fairly mass produced and it was seen as patriotic to, gin, to drink gin. Um, it was seen as Protestant to drink gin. Um, you know, good Protestants would, patriotic Protestants would, you know, like their gin. Um, and 
gin was very strong and it was very cheap. Um, and gin drinking really took off. So going back to this idea, it's the 18th century, you have the Industrial Revolution, the movement into the towns, you have slums, you have the urban poor, many of them very dislocated, alienated, removed from their sort of rural communities. Um, life, is, life is hard, probably hungry a lot of the time. I mean, an advantage of gin is um, that it staves off hunger pangs, um, gives you a bit of energy. Um, and there were probably, there's thought to have been around 7,000 gin, gin shops in London um, by about 1730. Um, you could buy gin on every street corner for a, pe for a penny. And it was very strong stuff. It was much stronger than modern gin. Also made with all sorts of weird and wonderful additives. Um, blindness was a very real uh, possibility. And it was, a, in a way, was, I think it was a bit like the crack, crack epidemic that tore through um, inner city America in the 80s. It was um, an unbelievable social problem. And, um, and it was the first recognizably modern drug scare, I think. Um, so here are you know, some basic stats, um, 1750, 11 million gallons of gin were being drunk every year. That's about 90 million pints, which is about um, 60 million bottles, which doesn't sound that much. I mean, I actually Googled last night British gin consumption 2017. I mean, we drank 47 million bottles last year, and there's 60 million of us. These guys drank 60 million bottles, and there were only about five and a half million of them. <laughs> and, <laughs> And most of it was drunk in London. I mean, you know, and Birmingham and Manchester, the big cities. Um, and huge rises in, in inner city crime, criminality, uh, degradation. A tipping point, the big scandal was in 1734. Um, a woman called Judith, I think Dufour, she, she checked her two-year-old son into a poorhouse. Um, because when you got checked in, you got given a new set of clothes. So this little boy was given a new set of clothes. And then two days later, she checked him out, strangled him, and sold his clothes for one shilling and four, four pence to buy some gin. And that was the major cause celebre. And that was, the, that was like baby, the case of Baby P, probably, back then. Um, and there was a sense of something must be done. And that something was the first gin act in 1735. Um, yeah, I should probably add, 75% of London children were dead by the age of five. But it needs to be said, these were poor children. This was the idle poor. Um, it wasn't the rich. The rich were simultaneously having a chocolate craze. Uh, <laughs> and actually, people did die from that uh, as well. <laughs> but not in those kind of numbers. Um, so as we move into the mid-18th century, um, the fundamental discursive shift that has stayed with us right now to the present is that gin starts to be constructed within a paradigm moral threat. So if you think of the old medieval drunkard, um, the problem wasn't beer or wine. That was really the good servant of God. Uh, the problem was the sinful nature of the, of, of the drunkard. But now gin is a moral contaminant. And this is a discourse that I think continues to inform current constructions of, you know, substance misuse, you know, you think of crack, heroin, crystal meth, opioids in the States. These would all be constructed as probably inherently harmful and bad. This is maybe where that discourse started. started. Um, yeah, the Gin Act. I mean, the, the second one, the 1751 Act, actually was quite successful. It forced um, a lot of, all the small gin, gin shops had to close. There was less access to gin. And the British government actually consciously and strategically started planting tea in places like India and consciously tried to encourage the, 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 the proles, you know, the proletariat, to become addicted to tea, which actually did sort of happen. There was a tea craze in the later 18th century. Um, there were riots against the gin acts. I've thrown in a, a good quote. A lot of the mobs chanted, long live gin, down with the king. Um, <laughs> And this discursive shift is, is you know, famously captured by Gin Lane. I mean, hands up, those of you who know this image. Yeah, OK. Not as many as I thought, actually. Um, so in Gin Lane, what do we see? Um, center frame, you've got a mother. Um, I think Roger might know, um, being a bit of an expert on syphilis, are those syphilitic? <laughs> I remember we shared a client in Cape Town with syphilis. Do you remember? And 
Are those syphilitic um, scabs on the legs, syphilitic rash? I think they could be. Um, so she's dead drunk. Um, she's dropping her baby down the stairs, presumably to its death. I think Hogarth here is referencing the 1734 cause célèbre, probably. Um, you see this guy, he is essentially um, fighting his dog for the bone. Um, you've got, I mean, he's possibly dead, the guy at the bottom. Um, you can see a gin cup in his hand. Um, a corpse is being robbed. You can see that in the wheelbarrow. Um, there's a bit of fighting going on in the background. So this is a scene really from hell. This is utter devastation. And if you think of the Madonna and child, I mean, in art, um, mother and child, Madonna and child is, is a symbol for perfection. It's a symbol for the natural order. Here, of course, Hogarth is showing us the natural order that Jin has turned on its head. The natural order has been completely destroyed by Jin. Um, Jin is mother's ruin. Um, in America at the same time, in a parallel process, I haven't got the room to go into, there was, there was a kind of rum craze. And of course, there the trope, you know, they spoke of the demon rum. In England, mother's ruin. Um, what was the saying? Drunk for a penny, dead drunk for two tuppence, and straw for free um, to collapse on. So, for the purposes of this talk, I guess the key point is the discursive shift is that gin is constructed as morally bad, as a contaminant, moral contaminant in and of itself. And gin drinkers. <laughs> are being constructed as unable to properly govern themselves. They're going to need to be governed by something else. And remember, this is the era of the Great Confinement. This is where we're moving as a society towards normalising, correcting and regulating people who deviate, which, of course, we still do today, very much so. Um, so one implication, yeah, the state's going to need to start regulating its subjects. Um, so remember what I was saying earlier, that the only... There were very few um, Tudor and Stuart statutes concerned with alcohol consumption. They didn't really bother. It wasn't a particularly significant thing for them. But now the state really does need to start becoming involved in regulating alcohol use. Um, and another key point is that, as Hogarth shows us, um, there's a gender shift in constructions of drunkenness. Women are now coming into the picture. And as we're going to see, this has very, very major implications for the female Victorian inebriate. How are we doing for time? I haven't got a clock. It's, it's 10. So I've got an hour. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. I've talked for hours. Um, so I get a bit worried. This is quite a dry academic area. Or is this sort of interesting? Interesting. Is it interesting? Yeah. Okay, good. Um, now, who knows this image? Beer Street. One or two. I knew only one or two would know it. Claire, do you know it? No. So everyone knows, or pretty much everyone, is aware of Hogarth's Gin Lane. Okay? That, that's the famous image. Almost no one knows Beer Street. Beer Street, also done in 1751, is Hogarth's accompanying image. What do we see in Beer Street? Good. Good. Yeah. yeah like this is the natural order. You know, this is um, all is well with the world. The world has not been turned upside down. You have um, jolly uh, people with massive, massive um, tankards of beer. You have wenches being groped. You have um, commerce. You have, you know, everything is good. So the message here, th this again, if you think back to that discourse of um, uh, Cotton Mather, you know, alcohol is a good servant of God. That's in this discourse. Beer is good. Um, everything is well, but gin is bad. So this is a morally dualistic construction. And again, that is one that continues to influence us to the present day. You know, we have, we have good substances and we have bad substances. Alcohol, of course, in the West is our, our celebrated substance. Alcohol is basically good. Heroin is bad, cracks bad, opioids are bad. So, what do we see is we've come to the sort of late 18th century, yes, I mean, because of the gin craze and um, the need of government to step in, alcohol use becomes a site for regulation of people. 
Um, and there's a new emergent discourse of, of alcohol, specifically hard spirits, as a threat to health, law, order, and social cohesion. Now, John Locke, he was a moral philosopher. His, his, the reason, his significance to this talk is that he was the moral philosopher who separated willpower from desire. That was Locke. Um, if you separate will from desire, then you can, you can think of a self-controlled actor who can, who can use will to guide their actions, even when will is contrary to desire. Um, and that creates the modern rational actor. This is, the, fa this is the, f the foundational philosophical basis for modernity, as we understand it. Self-control is the guiding ethic of our, of our culture. And importantly, without a will versus desire distinction, you can't have this notion of compulsion. If you think of the modern alcoholic, the modern alcoholic is ruled by compulsion. Um, if you look at the, the you know, um, <coughs> stories, for example, in Alcoholics Anonymous and AA, uh, it's all about compulsion. It's about someone who is possessed by, by compulsion, who wills to not drink, uh, and yet is overpowered by the desire to drink. Um, so that's thanks to Locke, and that's an important point. If Locke hadn't come up with this, we wouldn't have the modern construction of the alcoholic as a person in the grip of compulsion. Instead, we'd have the medieval sinner. So there's a movement away from choosing to drink, loving to drink, desiring to drink, medieval drunkard, sinful, to uh, more of a victim, someone who's experiencing a compulsion to drink. So we're now moving into around 1800. Um, Benjamin Rush. I'm going to focus more really on Rush. I mean, he was quite a character, Benjamin Rush, Dr. Benjamin Rush. He was, he was, he was the guy who um, popularised this idea of addiction as a disease. Although, as we've seen, in truth, um, a disease discourse had been around in England since at least the 1670s. Um, but Rush is normally credited with, with inventing it. Um, he was um, from one of, our boss, one of our colonies in America. Um, and, <laughs> and he, he was educated at uh, Edinburgh University, did med studied medicine then, then he went back to a uh, colony in America, Massachusetts. And um, he, um, he's, he, I mean, Rush, I mean, what can I say? He, he's seen as the founding father of American psychiatry. It's his profile on the APA's um, logo. Um, he was a very keen bloodletter. Um, in fact, he was blamed for killing Benjamin Franklin. I don't know if any of you knew that. Uh, through, through rather enthusiastic leeching and bloodletting. He was actually also blamed for hastening George Washington's death. Uh, again, through excessive bloodletting. Uh, and he invented a famous laxative at the time called a thunderclapper. Which, <laughs> which, uh, which was made with mercury. And actually, historians are delighted by that because they can follow Washington's army around America by looking for mercury traces in the soil. Uh, it was a very effective laxative, a thunderclapper. Um, so his relevance really to us is that he, Washington got a bit concerned. So, so our um, colonists had rebelled against their lawful king, George III, in the, in the 1770s. And... Um, a lot of them are drunk a lot of the time. And George Washington, who was, who was in charge of the Continental Army, was a bit concerned. And he called in Benjamin Rush. And Rush became the Surgeon General of, of, of that army. And so Rush became interested in drunkenness, initially in the, in, in the sort of rebel troops. And um, that interest stayed, <coughs> stayed with him. And he, he, he constructed drunkenness as a palsy of the will and a disorder of the mind. Trotter, we're not really going to worry about. Trotter was a contemporary. He was a Glaswegian naval surgeon, Thomas Trotter. He also talked about drunkenness as being a disease. For Trotter, drunkenness was a form of insanity. Or rather, insanity, drunkenness was a symptom of insanity. It was a form of psychosis, actually, technically speaking. We're going to stay with Rush. So here's some Rush stuff. Um, yeah, he wrote, the use of strong drink is at first the effect of free agency until from habit it takes place from necessity. So again, you know, drinking's not being constructed as freely chosen and driven by pursuit of pleasure in the way that it was for the medieval drunkard. Um, instead, it's been constructed as driven by, by, by satisfaction of compelled need, of compulsion. <coughs> 
quite a modern construction. And of course, what we're seeing is that the drunkard is, is moving away from religious discourse and he's starting to become visible within medical discourse. Rush wrote, and by the way, if you, if you Google, uh, if you go into Google Scholar, uh, you can read all Benjamin Rush's stuff in the original. It's all, it's all on Google Scholar, should, should you be interested. You may not be, um, uh, but it's quite interesting. Um, this is a good Rush quote. Persons who have been addicted to them should abstain from them suddenly and entirely. Taste not, handle not, touch not um, should be inscribed upon every vessel that contains spirits in the house of man who wishes to be cured of habits and intemperance. Um, so I suppose the point there is that he's advocating abstinence, but it's not global abstinence. It's abstinence from hard spirits only. Uh, and this, of course, is an important point. So Rush is very much constructing this palsy of the will and disorder of the mind within um, the sort of Hogarthian discourse that we saw earlier of hard spirits as moral threat. Hard spirits are, are the inherently addicting contaminants. Beer and wine remain the good servants of God. Um, this, of course, was an idea the early temperance movements were to take, and we're going to look at the temperance movement shortly. Now, Rush, um, you know, he was a pioneer, uh, way ahead of his time. He, he, he also prescribed various very, very, very radically new ways of governing the drunkard specifically sober houses. Um, now, what Rush met by, meant by sober house is not what's meant um, on some luxury cliff top in Malibu. <laughs> Anyone from Malibu here? <laughs> um, that, as we're going to see, the luxury Malibu sober house, that's in the discourse of the temperance movement idea of a sober house. What Rush was suggesting as a sober house is really what we'd think of as a, as a, as a private hospital rehab, um, a priory group type place, or a Sierra Tucson maybe type place. It was a place where the drunkard would be removed, the diseased and palsied drunkard, would be poor old guy, would be removed and, put, and essentially treated by doctors, given all sorts of weird and wonderful patented um, cures, um, which of course are still available, often at vast cost, um, and um, various countries in the world. And, um, yeah, some weird and wonderful patented medical cure that just didn't work. Um, and then training in moral fortitude. Um, but I think, I would say Rush's Sober House is a discursive progenitor of private hospital rehab. Um, and of course, what Rush was about, he wasn't about global abstinence. He was actually really about training the drunkard, the hardened guzzler of rum in America, to, um, to drink beer and wine temperately. That was really the object. It wasn't abstinence. Um, now, how do you justify removing people from, from society? Well, um, you, you justify it by constructing them as, as very dangerous people. Rush wrote that the drunkard was a risk upon the property and morals of their families, more hurtful to society than most of the deranged patients would be when set at liberty. Let it not be said that confining such persons would be an infringement upon personal liberty. So this is powerful stuff. The drunkard, you know, he's being constructed as a major threat. He's a moral threat. He's an economic threat. So let him be confined. Yeah. And of course, this confinement, as we're saying, can be contrasted with the old medieval drunkard being treated in his village as a local matter and essentially a <coughs> private matter for the drunkard, for his soul. Now, within the new medical discourse that Rush is constructing, um, the drunkard is very much someone who's unable to self-govern. Um, he's someone who needs to be dealt with. Um, and I think an interesting thing to consider is that ongoing management is something that AA offers, and, and we're going to touch on that when we get to AA. So by the time that Russia died um, in 1813, a new person had been, had been discovered or, or invented, the disease drunkard. Um, a new disease of drunkenness had been discovered. Um, a technology of correction and governance um, and normalization and regulation had been invented. Um, and 
the disease drunkard, of course, is being captured for medicine and psychology, you know, and psychiatry. This, 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 this starts to lay the philosophical rationale for their governance by medicine and psychiatry. Um, however, as we're going to see as we move into the 19th century, the problem for Victorian medicine, and maybe a problem medicine still has when it comes to dealing with drunkards, is that um, Rush's construction of the problem, it was a hybrid problem. It was a hybrid willpower, diseased or disordered brain problem. Um, it's a hybrid physical moral problem. And that's a tough one for medicine, because remember, medicine has a materialist epistemology. Medicine is all about um, things it can touch, see and feel. You can't really touch, see or feel a will. That's, that's a tough one, I think, even for very well-trained doctors. So, okay, we're moving now into the 19th century, and inebriates, yeah, Tony the child drunkard. Um, inebriates was the most common term really used in the 19th century to describe drunkards. So as we move from the old medieval habitual drunkard, we're moving to the 19th century, they tend to be called inebriates, which is a term I'll, I'll try and use. Now, what we're going to do now in this bit, we're going to, I'm just going to take you through medical treatment of the drunkard in the 19th century. Um, <coughs> Enlightenment doctors, Enlightenment medical discourse hadn't really thought too much about drunkards um, because, of course, drunkards were still the legitimate subject of religious discourse. Um, if they did think about drunkard, they thought of drunkenness as a symptom, really, of vice. Um, and they felt that drunkenness preceded madness. So while the drunkard would be categorized as insane, it was seen to, it was seen, the primary problem wasn't seen as insanity. That's the key point. Pre-1800, the primary problem was seen again as a sinful nature, which shows the power of the old religious discourse, even to shape medical discourses. And yeah, I mean, I think my reading of AA literature would be there's, uh, there's quite a big fear of going mad in it. If you look at the big book and the stories in the big book, quite a common theme is a fear of insanity. And I think that probably has traces of the old Enlightenment discourse that drunkenness can, can lead to insanity. Now, the problem then for medicine was, so okay, we have this new emerging discourse of the drunkard, not as a sinner, but as someone with this high, extra, sort of weird, hybrid, uh, moral, physical problem, a palsied will and a disordered mind. Um, but how can you really sort of incorporate that within a medical epistemology? Um, now, Escarol, he was an alienist, very famous psychiatrist who ran a big, big, big asylum in Paris, which he owned. Um, he came up with the theory of monomania. Um, so the theory of monomania essentially argues that the primary problem for the, for the drunkard, for the inebriate, is a diseased mind. The secondary problem is a diseased will. And the tertiary problem is various forms of vice. Okay, so this is a beautiful reverse, you know, it's a synthesis, really. It's, it's, and, it, and it captures the, the inebriate with, firmly within medical discourse, because here the primary problem is a medical one. It's a diseased mind. That, of course, accounts for a diseased will, and that, of course, explains vice and inebriety. And, you know, not surprisingly, Escarole's asylum filled up with drunkards, um, made him very, very rich. Um, asylums all over Europe filled up with drunkards who suddenly found themselves, probably much to their surprise, being diagnosed as insane. Um, and, chuck, and confined and chucked into, into some institution. Um, so the advantages from a medical angle of constructing drunkenness as a symptom of insanity um, were that it permits uh, medicine to be seen as legitimately governing drunkenness. So it's no longer about the church or the priest, it's, it's, it's about the doctor. You know, we're now in the 19th century, it's the era of the scientific method, uh, it's modernity, um, and it allows willpower not to be constructed as morally diseased, but as diseased by virtue of insanity. Now, that was an era which was very concerned with rationality. And of course, it puzzled them. You'd have otherwise respectable people, otherwise sensible people doing crazy stuff, 
when drunk. How, how do you account for that? Well, of course, one way of accounting for it is they have a diseased will. Um, here's some, here are the main medical models of the 19th century. Um, Trotter, the Glaswegian naval surgeon, that, that, that drunkenness is a symptom of psychosis. Um, Esquirol, uh, theory of monomania, that it's a symptom of insanity. Um, Rush, of course, that it's, it's, it's a physical moral disease of the will. Uh, Brill Kramer, 1819, um, it's, a, it's, it's a symptom of a disease of the nervous system. Huss, 1849, he was a guy who, who came up with the term alcoholic, although that wasn't used till the 1920s. Um, Huss believed really it was, it was located in the stomach, um, that it was a set of symptoms related to the nervous system. Beard, 1874, um, it's a symptom of hysteria. And then, of course, Maudsley, which we're going to look at Maudsley in some depth, a symptom of inherited degeneracy. Um, what these medical models share, of course, is that they're positioning the primary problem as a medical one, which, of course, they need to do, because to give you know, credibility to medical governance, you've got to have the primary problem as medical. You can't have it as something else. And drunkenness is some kind of symptom of a primary medical problem. Um, now, the great, for me, transcendented, transcendental sort of genius uh, writer on this period is someone called Giuliana Valverde. Um, anyone interested in this kind of stuff, she, she would be the person to read. I mean, she argues that these medical typologies bring, they bring, start to bring the inebriate, the Victorian inebriate, into view within a very sort of deviant social identity deviant by virtue of madness, hysteria, being degenerate, uh, deviant through moral weakness and vice, and deviant through the inability to practice self-control in their consumption. Again, this is someone who needs to be dealt with. Uh, I might skate through a few of these. I mean, in terms of you know, this idea that the inebriate more and more is a threat, um, which goes back, of course, to Hogarthian discourse and needs to be dealt with. Um, it's not only the asylums that start to fill up with suddenly insane uh, drunkards. It's also the prisons. prisons. English prisons start to fill up with drunkards. Um, 4,000 in 1860, up to 23,000 in 1876. Almost always working class. Now, we're going to talk a bit about degeneracy theory. I mean, um, I mean Maudsley, of course, is, is famous today. I mean, he was a sort of genius Victorian maverick doctor. Um, and he's, you know, Maudsley Hospital is named after him. What I would say is, you know, if you have a problem with a Cecil Rhodes statue in some Oxford quad, we should really have a problem with Maudsley Hospital being named after Maudsley. Um, I mean, it's quite incredible to the modern eye, degeneracy theory. Um, but Maudsley was the big fanboy of degeneracy theory in this country. He was the great proponent. Um, now, degeneracy theory um, essentially argued that degeneracy was, 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 was an innate, inheritable, biological trait. It was argued that drunkenness, it was, it was believed that it was sort of latent, but that drunkenness specifically could trigger this latent, this latent degeneracy into full sort of actuation. Um, and it was believed, yeah, generation one, you've got drunkenness. Generation two, a frenzied need for alcohol. Generation three, hypochondria. And generation four, idiocy. Um, and, you know, we can laugh. You know, I certainly, you know, I can kind of snigger my way through this as well, you know, because it's sort of mind-boggling. But actually, this was absolutely the dominant discourse of drunkenness in late Victorian England. And it, and it coloured um, legislation. It covered ver coloured various apparatuses of control from, from asylums to prisons. I mean, it was absolutely the dominant discourse. Um, and... Of course, you know, if you, if you buy this idea that, 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 you know, it's possible to have an innate degeneracy, and if you accept that drunkenness can trigger it, and that after four, generation, four generations you're going to have idiots being born, then um, naturally it follows from that that alcohol consumption is a very major threat to the empire, to the race, to society. And if you accept that, then... Um, 
then, it, then in a way you're almost morally obliged to legislate in all sorts of ways to control and regulate and govern alcohol use and people who drink alcohol um, excessively. And in the UK, that, that bore, bore fruit in the, in the Inebriate Acts. Um, so they allowed involuntary committal of anyone who committed a crime where alcohol was involved and anyone convicted of public drunkenness four times within a year. And the institutions and jails filled up mostly with women. Um, these four women here were um, from Birmingham, um, circa 1870. Um, there was a bre big brewery in Birmingham called Holtz Brewery, and um, it published a blacklist of habitual drunkards. Um, and th these were four such women whose photos were passed to local pubs in Birmingham so that the Birmingham pubs uh, would be able to bar them and not serve them. Very possibly um, sex workers who'd been in prison, I think, these women. Um, and what's interesting is actually their photos were not marked as inebriates. Their photos were actually marked in, 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 in the contemporary writing as habitual drunkards, which says something, I think, about the power of the old uh, discourse. Um, yeah, I mean, this shocker is by 1913, I think it was four or five American states could, could still legally sterilize women, uh, female drunkards. It was thought that they, um, there was some risk they could give birth to... Um, children with a tendency to crime, disease, or idiocy. So, you know, discourse has, has, has effects, um, and I think this is a very good example of that. It's also a very good example of the regulation of women. And if we go back to Hogarth and the natural order being turned upside down, you know, that's really where this discourse begins, that the state is going to need to start regulating women um, and managing them maybe around childcare and around their sexuality. Um, this is a quote from 198 from a Home Office um, Commission, um, which I think, you know, again, if you think of degeneracy theory, degeneracy theory is absolutely um, the underpinning to this, that the scum of the gutters and of the streets have been sent to reformatories with the excellent object of removing them from the scandal and danger which their life of freedom entailed. So the inebriate is being constructed as someone who, who's unable to self-govern. They absolutely need to be dealt with. However, paradoxically, just as we're hitting the 20th century, just as we've got all this legislation coming out which allows involuntary committal of drunkards, especially female drunkards, because actually probably what I should add that I haven't added is, at that time in the 19th century, um, there was a kind of stratification of the will, by which I mean um, men were believed to have more willpower than women, and upper-class men were believed to have more willpower than anyone else, and working-class women were believed to have less willpower than anyone else. Obviously, that, again, is a philosophical justification for governing and confining working-class women because they're the ones who need the most training and willpower because they are the most weak world. Anyway, we move into the 20th century, and, yeah, paradoxically, just as all these apparatuses are getting rolling with various systems of control and governance of the poor old drunkard, um, medicine kind of throws in the towel. Um, a 193 issue of the Journal of the American Medical Association states the inebriate must be willing to be cured. Um, Sir William Collins, he was a very sort of eminent Edwardian Victorian doctor. Um, he states, a disease it may be called, but a disease of the will, and a disease in which the individual has a most essential cooperative influence in his own worst mental betterment. This, of course, is an idea that AA was to pick up, the idea that the individual has to want to recover or want to stop drinking. Um, a 198 British Parliamentary Commission defined um, inebriety as a constitutional peculiarity. Um, the point here, I suppose, is medicine had kind of failed. Medicine had failed to properly medicalise the drunkard. The medical typologies, the medical models, and the medical treatments just didn't work. And the public knew that. Medicine acknowledged that. The British uh, Parliament acknowledged that. And, um, yeah. So the field really is open for other ways of treating addiction. However, before we get to AA, we're going to look at the temperance movements. Because, I mean, I've been focusing, I guess, the last 20 minutes on... on <laughs> 
the medical treatment of the drunkard or the inebriate in the 19th century. And I may have given the impression that was quite mainstream, but it wasn't. Um, I suppose some tens of thousands of inebriates went through medical systems, but many, many, many millions went through temperance systems. So we're going to turn to the temperance movements. Um, what's the time? What is it? This has got to finish at 11. Wow, OK. Um, OK, I'm going to really whiz through this. Um, OK, so temperance, the temperance movements, they're very much located in religious discourse. The early temperance movements, they kicked off in America, in the East Coast, Boston. Not surprisingly, you know, that was the home of um, Puritanism. Um, and the temperance movements, they weren't really worried about alcohol or beer. It wasn't about not drinking alcohol. It was about not drinking hard spirits. Hard spirits are the problem. So they're very much in the sort of Hogarthian, moral dualistic discourse of certain things as bad, evil contaminants, um, woe to drunkards. Other, other, but beer and wine are the good servants of God. Um, this is a great image. Here you've got the hardened, probably rum drinker or gin drinker. In the middle, you've got a reformed drunkard having a nice tankard of ale. Think of Beer Street. So this is Gin Lane, that's Beer Street, and then you've got maybe what AA would call a dry drunk on the far right. Um, and yeah, the temperance movement's international phenomenon. Um, a man called Father Matthew, he, he apparently signed up around two million people in Ireland in the 1830s and 40s. I think Ireland's population is about six million then, so that's one in three Irish. Um, either he was very good or Irish quite liked to drink. Um, and, um, but by the 1840s, the temperance movements had collapsed. Why did they collapse? They collapsed because, um, remember, their goal was not to abstain from all forms of alcohol. It was just to abstain from hard spirits, hard liquors, from gin and rum. Hadn't worked. Um, all their millions of members who'd got, who tried controlled drinking of, of beer or wine uh, had tended to relapse on, on, on the hard stuff. Um, and, um, and that was sort of known. And there was just a massive collapse of, of belief, really, in the temperance movements that it could actually work. However, in the 1850s, the Washingtonians emerged. And they were a temperance movement, but they learnt from the earlier failure and they pushed abstinence from all forms of alcohol, not just from hard spirits. Now, this is a new discourse, because remember, alcohol is a good servant of God. Suddenly, it's not. Suddenly, it's something else. In fact, suddenly, all alcohols are potentially morally corrupting. And, um, you know, this is an important discourse, of course, which AA picks up later on, this idea of needing to abstain from all substances. Um, So I was going to have to scan these to kind of cut. OK, so the Washingtonians, I mean, yeah, it was international, many millions of members. They pushed abstinence from all forms of alcohol. It was a fraternal organization. Um, and it created a technology of mutual self-help that um, AA is to draw on, as we're going to see. And it showed, actually, that, that, that actually the alcoholic can be cured. Um, through global abstinence allied to mutual help and moral reformation. Now, as we hit 1900, what we see is um, hundreds and hundreds of inebriate homes. Now, an inebriate home um, was more of what we think of now as a sober living, the Malibu-style sober living that we talked about earlier. The, the temperance movements, they funded hundreds and hundreds of, of, of sober houses, but sober houses in maybe a more modern sense, staffed by former drunkards, um, offering quite a loose level of care, a safe place to live while people went to temperance movements, to Washingtonian movements. A little bit like now, where you might live in a sober living in Malibu and be bussed out to local AA meetings. Not dissimilar. Um, OK, we're moving to AA. So the background, really, to the birth of AA was that by the 1920s, you know, you'd had the First World War, you had modernism, you had unbelief. Um, 
power of moral religious discourse had very much faded. Um, but meanwhile, of course, the competing medical project had also failed. Um, doctors could not cure alcoholism. And um, the field really was wide open for something new, and that something was AA. Now, I'm going to skate through some of these. Okay. I mean, I'm sure many of you are familiar with AA. Um, and <coughs> AA describes itself as a fellowship of men and women who share their experience, strength, and hope that they may solve their common problem <coughs> and help others to recover from alcoholism. Anyone can join AA as long as they meet one criteria, a desire to stop drinking. And remember, that was something that, that, that medical doctors had been saying around 1900 in British parliamentary co committees. They were saying the alcoholic, in order to be helped, needs to want to stop drinking. Um, AA views alcoholism as a biopsychosocial spiritual problem, and it states it has one purpose, to help other alcoholics recover from their illness. So AA discourse... Um, it mobilizes medical discourse. It uses medical terms um, like illness, disease, and recovery. But what it does with those terms is it uses them in ways and with meanings that take them completely away from medical discourse. Um, I mean, the illness is a theme, yep, it pops up throughout the big book. Illness, of course, is a medical concept. Um, and AA, you know, I think often is, is conflated by people with the disease concept of maybe Jelinek possibly even the neurobiological model of the 90s. Um, but it's absolutely not. Um, I mean, the word disease pops up once in the whole big book. Um, that's in the kind of quote here where it says, um, from it, from selfishness, essentially, stem all forms of spiritual disease. For we've been not only mentally and physically ill, we've been spiritually sick. When the spiritual maladies overcome, we straighten out mentally and physically. In other words, alcoholism is an illness which only a spiritual experience will conquer. The 12-step program, of course, is a very precise methodology specified by AA for providing this spiritual transformation. So how do we tie all these threads together? And we've been doing it in quite a hurry in the last few minutes. Um, so from existing common sense medical and moral discourse, A is drawn on the construction of the alcoholic as needing to want to stop drinking if they're going to recover. Um, from Christianity, AA drew on the tradition of bearing witness. So experience is the basis for knowledge within AA discourse. It's not about expert knowledge, it's about experiential knowledge. Um, that's quite a, an unusual thing in our sort of expert scientific episteme to, to privilege experiential knowledge. And from Washingtonian discourse, AA abstracted various principles of fraternity, organisation and voluntary commitment to abstinence from alcohol. Um, I mean, William White, who's very worth reading, um, he is a big historian of this area. I mean, he, he identifies the things that AA drew from the Washingtonians as a public gesture of commitment to abstinence from alcohol, public confession, support from group elders, public experience, pu public sharing of experiences of drunkenness, socialising with other group members, and performance of acts of service towards active drunkards. Um, from the Oxford group, AA took experiential sharing at meetings, taking stock of oneself, confession, restitution, <coughs> and a personalised conception of God. So that's what AA did take. I think it's very interesting what AA didn't take. Um, it didn't take scientific knowledge. It didn't take willpower. It didn't take a discourse of cure. Didn't take a discourse of moral reformation, and it arguably didn't take religion. I mean, my reading of the AA text actually is it's very religious, but technically speaking, it's not, I think. But it's, it's you know, sort of is. Um, <laughs> um, and unusually for our scientific episteme, AA privileges experiential knowledge over positivist, posit positivist knowledge. Um, you know, you think about it, I mean, you know, the admission of alcoholism as a self-diagnosis. I mean, for me and my work as an addictions counsellor, in a way, what I'm trying to do is, one, 
deconstruct denial and help the client make a self-diagnosis of alcoholism. In other words, it's either an unfortunate series of events or, or it's alcoholism. And deconstruct denial, see alcoholism, make that self-diagnosis, and then help them map out some kind of new way of life. That's, that's really the mission. Um, so, sort of concluding, I mean, while AA superficially deploys medical discourse um, with its construction of alcoholism as a disease or an illness, it's absolutely removing it from medical discourse. And that, of course, you know, which we haven't got time to go into, creates a lot of tensions. You know, if we're saying that it's completely removed from medical discourse, and yet if you think of 12-step facilitation private hospitals where you have all singing, all dancing teams of doctors, psychologists, various professional guilds involved of therapists and so on, and yet they're at the same time delivering some kind of 12-step treatment model, which is probably the norm in many places, how, how, does, how, how can you reconcile that? Because it's a spiritual illness versus some kind of quite vague neurobiological illness. I mean, that is the current medical typology, is the neurobiological model, but there's quite a few holes in that model. Um, so AA challenges actually and subverts medical discourse because the real problem is a spiritual one. Um, it challenges expert authority at depth um, because, of course, it's saying uh, only the alcoholic can self-diagnose, step one, and then treat, step two to 12, alcoholism, not experts. Yet, of course, you know, recovery has been monetized, professionalized, and commoditized by experts. Um, so, I've thrown in what, for me, is a really excellent definition of recovery um, by a woman called B Bjorkman. Um, she defines AA recovery as an ongoing spiritual transformation through engagement with AA's technologies of experiential practice and self-formation. Um, so this AA discourse of recovery, and of course that's not a, hardly a medical recovery. You think of recovery, recovery is a medical concept, it's a medical term. This in no way, shape or form is any kind of medical recovery. Um, so the AA discourse of recovery, you know, you can contrast it with discourses of cure, which is medicine, a moral reformation, which is the temperance movement. Um, you know, AA constructs the alcoholic as spir having a spiritual malady, malady, but not as biologically diseased uh, or sinful. So that's kind of it. So um, I suppose ultimately, if, if you look at the sort of the evolution of discourses of drunkenness and cure over the centuries, um, I think we can see that. Um, AA discourse is very much a synthesis of lots of pre-existing earlier discourses and um, that hopefully, you know, by thinking about this, because I know for me when I did this research, you know, you know having, despite having been immersed in addiction and recovery for many years, it's kind of new to me. So I hope it's been interesting for you. Uh, thanks for listening. We might have a couple of minutes for questions. I'm so pleased this is now over. <laughs> <laughs>